My name is Hosai Majedidi, and I'm here a community member here at MCC. I'm very honored to be with all of you. This is our second uh, panel with this exact same uh, format, where we are trying to bridge the divide, the generational divide, and also the cultural divide between the youth and the adults. Everybody on this panel with me, all my co-panelists, we are in the service of this community, and for years we have been on the receiving end of a lot of private conversations between parents and teens that where, where there's uh, definitely a conflict and they, they don't know how to navigate those conversations. So they come to us for our advice. So we have decided why not actually bring everybody together and try to have a conversation where everybody can benefit, inshallah. So with that, I'd like to ha ask my co-panelists to introduce themselves um, so that you can get to know them a little bit more, inshallah. So I'll start with my right. And if the brothers here can begin, just say a few words about who you are, what you do, and why you're here. Um, Salaam alaikum. Nice to see everyone. My name is uh, Azmat Mukhtar. Everyone knows me as Zishan. I live in San Ramon. I have three boys. Uh, my wife is on the panel. Uh, we were involved in the um, Ilm Tree Homeschooling Co-op and um, you know, learned a lot of things about parenting and actively tried to do the best we could there. And uh, the one thing I would say about myself is that I grew up in the United States, in New York, California, uh, moved around to Saudi Arabia, and um, you know, a lot of my needs weren't met when I was younger, which uh, became problematic later on. And so I feel like that experience helps me relate to youth, and I like spending a lot of time with youth. And so that's why I think I'm here. Zakla khair. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Aaron, AKA Haroon Sellers. I converted to Islam in 1994. And since then, alhamdulillah, I've been or striving to be a committed husband to my wife, committed father to my daughters. And I'm currently the audio visual manager at Zaytuna College. Um, some of my interests outside of work are photography, videography, um, building Lego Star Wars sets, Star Wars cosplay, and lots of other fun things. I'm here because I love Islam. I'm here because I love the Muslims. I'm here because I love Muslim youth. And I'm very excited to be in a gathering of parents, especially, because I think we have a lot to benefit from each other, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Suzanne Derani. I am a high school teacher by profession. I've been working with the youth for about a decade, actually a couple decades. And I'm also a Quran teacher, and I have been homeschooling my kids. I'm very excited to be here and to work with the youth, inshallah. Uh, I love working with teenagers. It's actually one of my favorite things to do. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Hina Khan Mukhtar, and I am the mother of three young men, wife of Zishan Mukhtar. My sons, our sons, are 22, 20, and 15 years old, mashallah. I've been teaching middle school and high school students since the mid-1990s, and I also write some articles related to the topic of parenting for Seekers Guidance. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, my name is Asa'ad Tarseen. Uh, I am married and have three children, ages uh, ranging from nine to almost 16. Um, also uh, with uh, Brother Zishan and Sister Hina at the uh, Ilm Tree Co-op uh, and been active in the community for a number of years in different capacities, sometimes working with youth, sometimes working with uh, adults, uh, mostly in education, uh, but excited to be here with you all tonight, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, jazakallah khairan. I would like to now ask um, our volunteers to please come up. They're going to distribute surveys for the teens, as well as index cards for the adults. So in the all right, assalamu alaikum everybody, again. Um, so we've got some questions up here, but before we dive into the individual questions, we thought it would be a good idea to maybe just go over some general principles. With some of the surveys that came in, I was skimming through them and looking at what were some of the questions that young people were asking, and a few that caught my eye 
um, that I think maybe would be a good idea to start off addressing is um, more than a couple of kids talked about how they feel like they're very tightly controlled by their parents or they feel that they don't have any freedom or they feel like their parents don't listen to them and they feel that they're not heard and then there's on the flip side there are parents saying my kid doesn't talk to me I don't know what's going on in his or her life and how do I how do I get my children to open up so before there can be any kind of success in any relationship it's really important that there be trust and that there be vulnerability and there be open communication and as parents it's going to be crucial that we learn how to set ourselves up for success so that there can be trust and vulnerability and open communication and one of the things that I know I found very helpful in our family and some of my friends have been implementing for a number of years and I've seen success in their family as well is setting up a weekly family meeting where there's a set time in the week where the parents get together with the kids and they're not allowed any distractions people aren't bringing their phones and their laptops to their meeting they're not allowing the house phone to interrupt them or other you know social activities or friends it's a dedicated time that the kids have on their calendar and that they know that from this time to this time on this day I have to meet with my my parents and my siblings and I can't opt out of it and different families had different ways of conducting these family meetings I know one of my friends their family members took turns leading the meeting and then in other families it was parent directed but every family should figure out for themselves what's going to work best for them but the point is over time to create um, an environment where kids know that they're going to have an opportunity to talk about what's going on in their lives and parents are going to have an opportunity to talk about any concerns they have or positive feedback that they want to give it's going to take time to build that trust and vulnerability it doesn't happen overnight but it's worth the investment if you do it week after week month after month year after year you'll be surprised at what people are willing to share over time I, I know of a father who met with his daughter for brunch since she was like five years old every Friday they would go out for brunch and when she was younger they didn't have anything super exciting to discuss maybe it was even boring for the dad but now that the daughter is older and she's college age she's talking to him about a lot of real life issues and getting his feedback on things that are important to her and um, I don't know if any advice you have, Dr. Asad, about open communication. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Before I, I add on to that, I'd actually first like to, um, to congratulate all of you for being here. Um, and I think it is very important. It's a, it's a show of your dedication to your children. Um, and it's also a reminder that we all are struggling with these challenges. Um, I don't know of a parent of a teenager uh, who feels like, oh, this is easy and I don't know why other people have problems. And uh, it, it's always a challenge um, and it's something that we face together as a, com uh, as a community. So, uh, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all and, and uh, accept it as an effort from you all and bless your parenthood with tawfiq and ease, inshallah. Uh, I would add on to Sister Hina's comments, uh, maybe just a little bit, which is um, to reflect on the Islamic teachings of the different phases of childhood, of, of, of parenthood, I should say, perhaps, where um, in some narrations attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu and some to Sayyidina Ali, uh, but the, the, the principle is the same nonetheless, which is to play with them for the first seven years, uh, and then to discipline them for the second seven years, and then to befriend them for the third set of seven years. So pretty much after 14 lunar years, which is probably age of 13, interestingly, right, or uh, thereabouts, uh, the relationship should really change. Um, and I think it is important, uh, Sister Hina used the term being vulnerable and open communication. These are aspects of, of friendships. These are aspects, even if there's, you know, some of my closest friends are older than me. Um, and I treat them with a certain kind of respect that I don't treat somebody my own age, but it's still a friendship. I can share things with them, I can be open with them, I can be myself with them. 
um, and even if they will uh, correct me or advise me, I'm, it's going to be in a very different spirit than a position of authority sort of scolding me. Um, so I think the, the, the first thing to consider is maybe um, framing the entire relationship, uh, uh, going from a much more vertical to somewhat more horizontal. Um, of course, it still should entail respect and, and uh, an adab towards the parent, um, but especially in, in our society here, I think that's, that's an important facet uh, to, to, to include. And that way, when you do have something like a family meeting, the likelihood of a child uh, or a teenager, no longer a child, young man or woman, you know, one of the things I grew up with was my parents' generation always saying, you know what Sahaba were doing at your age, people were leading armies at your age, but I want you home by six o'clock, right? So that, that we, we want both sides of that, right? Uh, but it, it, it comes with, with both sides. So they are young men and women, and we have to start to view them as young men and women, um, especially in a society that keeps trying to keep them um, as children on, on, on one level, that really fights a type of maturity and a type of responsibility for your own actions. Um, and we, we can maybe get into that, inshallah, uh, a bit later. But I think that when you... Uh, it realize that this is difficult for everyone and that there aren't really clear answers um, and that this is a struggle and a process uh, you will look less for solutions right there's a difference between a solution and a treatment if I give you a math problem there's a very finite amount of time you'll get to the solution or if I say the microphone is broken up front there's a wire that's broken there's a solution you can fix it it's a problem and it has a solution but when you think of things as diseases and treatments, you start, you start to realize you don't take medicine and you feel better immediately. That there's a, it's a process of healing and it's a process of growth. Um, so whatever struggles we may have, we have to also bring along with it, I think, the patience um, to see that whatever changes we make, that it will take time and the relationship will have to grow with it. Um, and so we, we shouldn't approach some of these uh, as problems that require solutions. How? What's the solution for my child doing X? That, 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 that may not be the best way to, to think of the question. Um, and perhaps something more of, how do I start to get my child to become more of Y? And you'll start to see it a bit more gradually. Uh, wallahu alam. Turn it back to you. So when Dr. Asa just mentioned about how um, vulnerability and trust is, there are also elements of a friendship. That just reminded me of a really fascinating article I just read recently about what it is that really makes a friendship. It's also a TED talk. And it was really interesting. They, these experts broke it down and they said that a friendship is like a pyramid, a triangle, and there's three sides to it. And you need all three sides in order to have a friendship. And when I saw that pyramid, I reflected and realized why some of my friendships have really thrived, mashallah, and why some friendships have floundered despite my best efforts. And the same three sides can be brought to your relationship with your children as well. So the three sides to the friendship, the bottom, they said the base of the relationship has to be positivity. So it has to be a positive interaction where somebody feels that they're seen, they feel that they're heard, they feel that it's a positive interaction, they feel that um, they're not constantly being criticized. It's not constant downer, not constant doom and gloom, depression. Making each other feel better. So, that's, so if you look at your friendships that are probably the most successful, you realize that there's a lot of positivity involved in your interactions. And then the other two sides of the triangle were, so positivity is the base. The other side is vulnerability so that you have to be willing to share of yourself and talk about things you've been through and that you've grown from and then also be willing to hear another person share their struggles. And then the third side was consistency, so that you are actually seeing each other on a regular basis or making an effort to get together, communicate, talk on the phone, whatever it is. So that's where the family meeting can come into play because especially as our kids are becoming teenagers and going into the college age, what I've been surprised by the most is really how busy everybody's schedules are, especially here in the West. Everyone's running in different directions. We're always in the car. Um, and we have to actually schedule time to get together and make sure that we're checking in with one another. And 
In our family meetings originally, when we started having them, it was easy to start out those family meetings with just checklists of things that need to be taken care of and chores that need to be done, but that can take away from a little bit of the positivity, right? So it's also going to be important to validate one another in those meetings. Okay, so I think maybe we'll start jumping into some of the questions. Do you have one you want to address? Um, yeah. Mm, these two, I think, are somewhat the same. So. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, this is one I think that uh, particularly parents of teenage boys may relate to, but also teenage girls. Um, and this is a question that says, Assalamu alaikum, how to stop a teenager, again, that's a very solution-oriented, right? How to stop, but I, I understand. I have that impulse as well. But let's phrase it as how do you help a teenager um, reduce playing uh, games and on their cell phone all the time? So the problem that we're recognizing that needs help is uh, that, you know, teenagers are on their devices or playing video games all the time. Uh, so before I try to weigh in on that, I have, to, I have a disclaimer to make. Sometimes when you come to listen to a panel, you might assume that the person speaking is either an authority or has already been successful on that. These are things that I'm struggling with as a parent. So this is, we're all sort of working through this together. I have teenagers that I, uh, you know, have these very same conversations with. Uh, a few things that I think are helpful um, is, one is to also begin with a degree of sympathy for your teenager. That if you are aware of how often we as adults can get sucked away, right? Um, that, you, that you have to sympathize with how addictive these devices are to begin with. Um, and to not see it as something that they may be doing intentionally or, or treat them in a way in which, you know, they, you know, they, they should be so much, so it should be so easy for them to resist. Uh, the second thing I would say is it is important to have very open conversations with your children about the fact that after you sympathize and say, I understand these games are fun, I understand these games are addicting, I understand you need to stay in touch with your friends, um, but education is also useful. And to sit there and spend time with them, um, my son and I, I might get in trouble for some of these statements, but my son and I, we read an article together about how Silicon Valley execs have called these devices digital heroin because of the degree of addiction and the uh, dopamine release that's, that's, that's attained when you get a notification or a ding. Uh, so much so that one of these Facebook execs, he told his secretary, he gave her the password to his phone, the, the administrative thing, and said, if you allow me to download a social media app, I will fire you because he didn't trust himself. If you allow me, I will fire you. You have to make sure I never download this. When you have these conversations with your, with your teenagers, even if you allow them to have some degree of access, just so they are aware of the degree of danger. Sometimes we let them have desserts, right? But we tell them, you can have one, but if you have five, here, you're going to have these problems as a result. Um, so discussing with them that, that, you're, that you're going to be reasonable and expect some degree, given the fact that they're teenagers and they're surrounded, unfortunately, by other teenagers, right? That's the main problem. Um, and because of that, that you want to uh, be understanding, but also start to set gradual guidelines for decreasing. So you say, okay, how about this? Let's go, Mo almost all phones will have, I'm sorry, almost all phones will have uh, a, a way to know how much time has been spent on the, on the phone. Right? So you say, okay, let's just look at your use for the last week without criticizing. You're not going to say, oh my God, I can't believe this three hours, in, right? You just want to assess it. You're going to be like a personal trainer. Somebody comes in and they're at a certain weight or they're at a certain speed when they're running. You're just going to say, hey, let's see how fast you run a mile. That's your, going to be your starting point. Let's start setting some goals. Or do you agree that it's a problem to be on your phone that much? Yes, when they're not on their phone and they're away from it for a while, you, if, if you have a reasonable conversation, teenagers, they'll admit to you, yeah, I, you're right, I shouldn't be on it so much. Okay, so let's start setting goals. And if you work to make gradual progress, you can make progress. Um, and I would also say the other thing, uh, this is just my own, my own uh, uh, personal anecdote is, 
Nagging is a way to bring the opposite effect of what you're nagging for for a teenager. So you have to be very careful about how you communicate because as they're asserting their independence, they feel like they're young men and women and they should be, they, they want a degree of autonomy. To treat them like that your just simple word or command should, should alter their behavior, even if they listen to you in that moment, they will start to develop a resistance in their mind to this very thing, that they should be able to regulate this for themselves, right? Um, so one thing I would say is to have conversations, to help talk them through this, and to work on, on realistic goals. And I'll turn it over to Sister Hina if she has anything to add. Well, one of the other questions wasn't just about video games, but it was also about using cell phones and being on your phone constantly. One of the things that we've uh, found to be really helpful is um, not just one of the rules in our home has always been that the cell phones aren't used in the privacy of the bedrooms and so they're only used out in public so in our loft or in our family room in our living room and um, recently one of my son's um, friends has come to start living with us and so before he started living with us, my husband and I sat down and kind of went over with each other, like what are going to be our expectations, what are going to be our rules, because this is a young man who's, mashallah, you know, 18 years old, so he's, he's a young adult, but at the same time, there's a potential to influence the family culture and, and what's going on with everybody in the home. And so we only came up with two things, and one, one was that we were going to request that cell phones are not used in the privacy of the bedroom or laptops and that they're only used out in, in public and in order to make even a private phone call you can go outside or we'll give you you know privacy out in the living room but not in the bedroom and he agreed to that alhamdulillah but even he's noticed that it's so healthy to not have the cell phone in your bedroom because the tendency to want to scroll for hours on end, to look, check it first thing in the morning, to be on it late at night, to waste a lot of time on it, is reduced significantly when you're out in public and you've got other people around you who are going to want your attention, who you're going to want to make conversation with. So video games is not something I, we actually have that much experience with in our home, but cell phones is definitely, I think, something that everybody I think every family struggles with it, trying to figure out how to limit it, how to deal with it. And I think personally that having, self, having that one rule that cell phones are not used in the privacy of the bedroom is, can really um, make or break the experience. So. Assalamu alaikum everybody. <clears throat> Alhamdulillah, please forgive me for not being here. Uh, earlier, I, I missed, I'm sure, some very fruitful discussion. Um, I was actually looking over a lot of these survey um, results that we have and, and the questions. There was an area for the teens to provide their, their specific questions. So this is actually coming from the teens uh, at tonight's event. And some of the um, questions really had to do a lot with, um, with uh, being allowed to hang out with friends so some, you know, their teens are really worried about um, their parents maybe being a little too overprotective and controlling when it comes to their social life. And so that's something that in my own personal experience, I have had this probably right up there with devices. It's one of the biggest concerns coming from the teens. And there seems to be, again, um, maybe again a generational or a cultural um, divide there about how to, you know, how much is too much, right? And what groups of people are my teens allowed to socialize? For example, um, between genders, right? I have had to um, definitely have that discussion with some families where the girls have, because they're classmates, they, you know, grow up maybe sometimes with boys from a very young age in the same school environment, and they form these friendships with them that they think it should be perfectly fine and normal by the time they reach, you know, the high school years to hang out in a large group setting with, with, uh, with those same, very, very same kids or same boys. So that obviously poses, you know, a problem because as we all know, when children come of age and they're actually more, health, you know, responsible and they become adults in Islam through, um, you know, adolescence and puberty, that 
th that shouldn't happen and actually we should start separating them more. So how do we, um, you know, navigate this particular issue because it's everywhere, everywhere they look, you know, this is very normal in the society around us, you know, and it's becoming more normal even amongst American Muslim teens where they feel that these things are not a big issue. So that's something that maybe our panelists, because they have the experience. My children are still young. I have 10 and 7 years. I'm just, you know, I, I'm, I'm uh, reflecting on what I've, what's been shared with me, but I think we can also maybe turn to our panelists because they do have older kids to ask maybe some advice or tips on how do you uh, have that discussion in terms of gender, um, you know, mixing and, and friendships with the opposite sex. <laughs> That's a heavy one. I didn't, I didn't actually come mentally prepared to discuss that, but it's an important topic. I need a moment to think about this. Um, so when, I, yeah, please, Bismillah. Yes, yeah. I, I don't have a response, but I'm going to give Sister Hinda some time, um, and maybe just set up some um, basic principles that I think are very useful for this topic and topics similar to that become more and more serious. We're not talking about phone use and video games. We're talking about things that, that tend to have greater consequences. Um, there, you know, something that some Shiyu have said that I have found very useful is they said, make sure that you develop a relationship with your children, that when something happens, the first person they think of to call is you. Not that they're running away from you, how, oh man, I can't, my parents can't find out about this, right? But they should feel so safe, even if they know that you would disapprove. They would know that their first impulse should be to call you because your first reaction will be to help and to guide and to love, right? That's not a very easy thing to do. It's a very high ideal, I think, right? Um, but that should be a goal. The second is we should strive to have relationships with our teenagers in which, although they may still have shame with us, we don't force them to start to live a secret life. Where if we set a standard that becomes so difficult for them to fulfill, one of the challenges about that is you can, it's very common for Muslim kids, you hear this more times than you care to admit that they live a double life. They just start to hide things from their parents. And I don't mean just out of shame that they won't mention things, but they will, they literally will have an entirely, like they'll live a double life. And that becomes very dangerous because then a parent has no ability to guide, to teach, to advise any of those processes, right? So even if it's something you disapprove of, it may be good to develop a ground rule to say, you can talk to me about anything, even if I disapprove of it, you can come to me, we can discuss it, I can advise you, but I'll share with you my disappointment, but you're safe from that. Don't, don't, don't let, make the first thing you think about, you know, my, my parents are going to kill me. So the first one is make sure that they flee to you and not from you when they're in trouble. And the second is try to keep them in a way where they can be open about their challenges, even open about the things that you may disapprove of, so that you don't push them to the point of, of hiding and going underground. Uh, and living a double life. Hopefully that gave Hina some time to, act to answer the actual question. So I guess the reason I'm, I'm hesitating before answering is because I am trying to be mindful of the fact that my sons are in this community and anything that I share about how we do things in our life, you know, it's kind of putting their business out there. And um, so I want to be respectful of that. So I was just while Dr. Asad was speaking, I was thinking about, okay, what could I share that maybe they, they wouldn't mind me blasting out all over <laughs> MCC's videos. Um, so I remember when my, my kids were little, and, and I, I'm not saying this as, as if we're the role models or the examples for everyone to follow. I'm just talking about what our experience has been as far as our young men growing up now into the early 20s and the teens of interacting with uh, the opposite gender. So when they were little, I remember my uh, husband once saying that, you know, Hina, I want our house to be the house where all the kids want to hang out. Like, that this is where our kids want to bring their friends home to. 
And um, alhamdulillah, he, his, I think, dream came true in that we, a lot of our social life is occupied with our kids' friends coming over. And with having homeschooled our sons up until eighth grade, I, for me, it was very important that I didn't want my boys to be socially awkward and to not know how to speak to the opposite gender, but to also keep in mind what the rules of the religion are, what the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, is. So to that end, um, I, I personally and my husband also, we really like our, our kids' friends, mashallah, and there are young women in the group and there are young men in the group as well. These are kids that they've grown up with. The difference is that my husband is also friends with all the kids and I am as well. And so we end up socializing together in our home. So we might have like a movie night or you know, the kids might come over and have dessert with us after dinner and we all sit together and talk, talk about politics, talk about what's going on, talk about religion, talk about books that we're reading. But there's oversight in the sense that my husband and I are there as well. And, but it came from becoming friends with our kids' friends and like gaining trust with them over the years. And this isn't necessarily true like for all of our friends, uh, all of the kids' parents. It's not necessary that they have the same relationship with all the kids. But this is something that's happened in our home. And when we started entering into the social media age and the kids were, you know, asking if they could get the Instagram accounts or whatever, having a talk with them also about how they were going to be interacting with the opposite gender, gender on social media because it's, a lot of us tend to think that interaction with the opposite gender is, oh, it's about dating or it's about, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, but sometimes it's really just about how people are joking around and communicating with one another online. And so, as a mother of sons, um, talking about how to be respectful uh, of the opposite gender and how to behave online in a way that you would behave in person. So an example would be um, if girls are posting selfies and photographs of themselves, that's not something that would be really appropriate for a young man, in our opinion, to be clicking like on because it's not something that our young men hopefully would be doing in real life. They wouldn't be going up to girls and being like, you look beautiful, you look hot, you know, that wouldn't be okay. And so it wouldn't be okay to do that online as well. And so constantly talking to them, or not constantly because that becomes nagging, but, you know, checking in with them about, um, and role modeling for them as well, like what is the appropriate way to behave with one another. Um, if. We even have WhatsApp groups where there are guys and girls on the WhatsApp groups, but again, we're involved in them as well. Um, it's not just a boy and a girl alone talking, um, inshallah, and from my understanding so far. And so I think one of the key, key things in our experience has been really befriending our kids' friends and taking the time to get to know them. So those of you who especially have younger children, really making an effort to get to know them. Kids are not going to fully open up in front of parents the way they do in front of one another, but um, taking time to make your home be the place where kids want to come hang out, whether it's watching a movie together, whether it's having ice cream, checking in. Um, yeah, that's I, I, just off the top of my head. I think that's what I was like, all I can think of right now. That was great, great tips. <clears throat> And I think what I got from your, um, both of your responses really is about open, direct communication about these things. Because a lot of times, many of our cultures, it, it's, it's uncomfortable, right? We don't, you know, in my family, for example, I mean, it was never spoken about. Never was the issue of having a, a friend from the opposite gender ever brought up. It was just understood that that was not acceptable in your home. And so we would never even talk about these things. But um, I think, you know, we have to just keep in mind the great advice of Said Ali, who said that, you know, do not raise your children the way that you were raised because they're born into a new generation. 
So whatever cultural or you know, dynamics that you had or you know, family dynamics that you had, we have to kind of just be more realistic that our children are growing up in a completely different time than we were. Um, and, it, and, and a lot of these things have to be discussed, even if it's uncomfortable and it's uh, awkward for you to put your own um, comfort aside, because otherwise, if we're not having these conversations with them directly, they will seek out other people to have conversations with. And what happens oftentimes is other messages are so counter to the principles of our faith that they actually end up sounding better, right, to teens who are so impulsive and it sounds so, you know, fair and open-minded and then, you know, here's nothing on this side of it. It's just no or nothing at all. And so we kind of have to balance um, whatever the messaging that they're getting outside with you know, reflection with wisdoms, with, you know, just having open conversations because it will, to them, the impression that they leave is that Islam is, you know, outdated, it's um, not, you know, there's no context, or there's no context for it in modern times, um, Muslims are awkward socially, that's what they leave with if we don't have discussions with them. So we have to really think about that and just having, you know, asking them how many, who do you hang out with at school, being frank with them, what are their names, and if they say a boy's name or a girl's name, not thinking it's the end of the world, and you know, immediately shaming them or blaming them, but rather asking what is it about that person that you enjoy their company and trying to just foster again an understanding and a conversation where you can see you know, why they choose the people that they um, are hanging out with and, and who those people are. It's very important that we know who those people are. So alhamdulillah. Um, now the next question, I'm going to actually ask the parents because I want to gauge how you guys, I mean, if you guys, you know, are seeing what we see. So there was a question on the survey about do you support gay rights? This is a hot topic issue. A lot of, it's everywhere in our society now. We can't really escape it. So we, this is another topic we have to confront head on. So I'm going to ask you by a show of hands, there's three options that we gave, okay? I'll read them to you and then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand based on what you think uh, your team maybe or the majority of the responses uh, were, okay? The first answer was, um, do you support gay rights? So the first question, answer, excuse me, was yes, I don't see anything wrong with being gay at all and think it's perfectly fine to be gay. The second one was, yes, I think gay people deserve to have rights, but I don't agree with their lifestyle. And the, th the third is, no, I don't support gay rights at all. So I want you to think about your team and everything you've raised them with and all the maybe discussions you've had or maybe you haven't, but just what you think they answered on this survey. If you think your teen answered the first one, which is yes, I don't see anything wrong with being gay at all and think it's perfectly fine to be gay, raise your hand. I didn't think that we'd have anybody for that. Okay. Um, the second, yes, I think gay people deserve to have rights, but I don't agree with their lifestyle, if you think. Okay. So this is, again, based on your knowledge of your teen. Okay. The third one, no, I don't support gay rights at all. How many of you think your teen answered that? Okay. What do you think the majority of the answers were? One, two, or three? Do you think we had any one? We had quite a few of the first one. Quite a few, online and here. This is, again, a sweeping sentiment across our society, across our community, um, where people are feeling that it's not a big deal. This is another very important discussion that we have to be able to frame in a healthy way and have open discussions because again, as I just you know, sort of um, alluded to, when you don't have discussions, then the dominant opinions that are being presented sort of take over and then people, you know, that's how people succumb and eventually majority wins. Oh, well, if everybody thinks this way, then I don't want to be an outcast, so I should think the same. So how can we balance that, right? We have to have open discussion. So I'm gonna again turn to my panelists and ask them, how do you talk about this issue with your teens? I'm sure it's come up um, with your teens. How did we frame this discussion? 
Oh, okay, okay, very good point. This might be a good time to just do a quick time check for prayer. Um, Brother Munir, do we have, it's, is it time? Okay, so think, we'll, we'll pause right here, but we're going to come back and address this hot topic issue, inshallah. Okay, all right, jazakallah khair, and we'll stop for prayer. Parents here have had an open conversation with their teenagers about this topic. I'm seeing probably a quarter, maybe a third, okay, maybe a third at best. More from the uh, mother's side than from the, the, the father's. Uh, I would say a starting point is to begin there, right? That having this as a topic that society is literally uh, inundating you with um, and almost pushing down your throat, uh, it, that it's normal, that it must be acceptable. But beyond that, that to have any criticism of it is a type of bigotry. Now, for the American mind, there's nothing more revolting than, than being called a bigot, right? And so if, if that is equated with bigotry, by treating someone unfairly, just because of something that's incidental to them, the way they were born, right? Then that's a type of bigotry. So you have to be able to have, navigate conversations with your teens about these topics. Now, some of you may come from places that this was never even a thought. Your parents never had to discuss this with you. You could have lived the rest of your life and never had to deal with this. Your children have a different reality. And so what worked for you, as uh, Sister Hosai reminded us, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said, nasu ashbahu bi zamanihim min abaihim. That people resemble their age more than their own father. Right? That's, that's what they will resemble more. The age, the time will have more, more, greater impact upon raising your children than what you do yourself. And so how do you, if you know that that's there as a, as a factor influencing your children, you have to be able to address it. Uh, in my experience, an open conversation, which is not reactionary, right? And what I mean by that is, if your teenager is made, your, the young adult in your home, was formulating their own opinions and their own ideas. They have their own personality, their own autonomy. Uh, and they're being told by people that we send them to in school or in the media. These authorities are telling them one message. If you want to bring, present another side, you have to come with good arguments. And you have to come willing to listen and you have to come willing to share. Uh, I would suggest addressing this question with your teens head on. And I would suggest doing so in a number of ways, from it's, uh, taking it from a number of different perspectives. The Islamic perspective, or you know, what could be can called the Islamic perspective, is one that goes beyond just, is this a sin, yes or no? This is something, alhamdulillah, the ijma'a, the consensus of Islam is very clear on. There's no question marks there. But your child is processing a world that's telling them that anything like that is bigotry, or it's unfair, or it's hatred. Nobody wants to be hateful. You have to help them to reconcile these two things. So I'll tell you a story. There was a, a, a scholar who was visiting from a West African country, and he was, doesn't speak English, he's here visiting. And someone asked him, who was a convert to Islam, he said, I have a relative of mine, and this relative they're openly homosexual and my, my Muslim friends are telling me that I cannot have a relationship with him. Is this true? And the shaykh, again, this is still very foreign to him. It's not his, but he said, shirk is bigger than that and you have to keep ties with shirk, right? Shirk is greater than that, but you can still keep ties with that. So we have to, that framework should be that I can tell you that your beliefs are wrong, that your actions are wrong, and still respect you and still treat you kindly. So this is a false dichotomy that you're, that's being forced on the Muslims. That in order to be respectful, in order to be kind, you have to accept what everyone does. That's, that's, not, that's not, you have to help your children to break through that fallacy. That's a lie. You, they'll see through it and you tell them, they come to us, this is something Sister Hosai was saying, or I'll have to give the credit here. She said they come to us with the uh, with the call for acceptance. You have to accept us as we are, total acceptance. 
But in turn, they're not accepting us as we are. So that mutual respect has to be there. And so we have to help our children, our teens, these young adults to see that part of this is that they have the right to also have their opinion. You can be respectful, you can be kind, you don't, it does not have to equate hate, right? Uh, and we can still believe that this is immoral and it's forbidden and it's wrong, etc. The two are not mutually exclusive, right? The two are not mutually exclusive. And so we have to develop some nuance in which even if we accept that somebody has this affliction or this challenge or this desire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed for whatever reason, we all have desires that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in us that we have to fight. Since when does that mean, oh, embrace, oh, you have that desire, embrace it. Bismillah. That's not our religion to begin with. So even this argument of, oh, but I think they were born that way. Yeah, of course, we're all born these ways. We're all born with things that we have to... So help them to break out of this simplistic way of viewing it that, oh, what if they were born that way? And, you know, why? We can't hate them. We can't have bigotry, etc. Bring some nuance to the conversation in which you can accept that they're a part of society that isn't going to disappear, that we can engage them and treat them with respect, but that we also ask to be respected for our beliefs. And we also cannot be subject to bigotry. And we also cannot be forced with their intolerance to say, accept, change your religion to accommodate us. Right? So this is something that is, that is very important. And this happens with beliefs about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not an iman issue. It's not... You know, but even with shirk, we say people, لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ You have your way, I'll leave you to your way. Leave me to mine. So this is, we should help our children to develop a sense of self in which they are okay standing on their own and saying, uh, this, is, this is my belief. My last point before I'm going to pass it off to Sister Hinna, uh, because I'd like to hear what, what she'd have to add, is train your children to expect to be opposed by society, to be outnumbered by society. The Prophet ﷺ said, بَدَأَ الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا That Islam started as a strange thing. وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا And it will become strange again at the, near the end of time. فَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَى So blessed are those who are estranged. Right? That this is something, if you read the Qur'an, which Prophet has all of his people welcome him and accept him and believe in him from the beginning? Nobody. They're always opposing people. It's always the mass of people against them. So we should try to train our children to accept that they may have to be different. And they will be different. And that wrong is wrong even if everybody in the world is doing it. And right is right even if nobody else is doing it. That we have to give it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Last statement in closing, a scholar, a great alim in, 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 uh, from Syria, he said, he said to someone, he said, when you go to America, tell them, that whatever sins they make, the door of tawbah is open. The door of repentance is open. But if they say that the haram is actually halal, you can't make tawbah from that. That will bring Allah's displeasure upon you. So let, it's, he said, I mean, we don't say this to a teenager, but it's okay if they sin because they can make tawbah from that. But tell them to be careful of changing the religion of Allah because you can't make tawbah from that. Because you're changing it. So say, you can keep the halal halal and the haram haram and don't change your religion and be strong in who you are and your own identity. Be respectful, be kind, be generous. Allow them to لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ But also have your own beliefs about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permits and what He forbids. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's right. He created us. He's a creator of humanity. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Bismillah. Just on the topic of the whole LGBTQI um, issues. Uh, a few years ago when gay marriage was legalized, uh, I was kind of surprised to see how many of my friends whose kids were in public school were surprised at how supportive their children were of, of, of the new law. Because the parents assumed that their kids were gonna be on the same page as they were on this topic. But they didn't realize that for so many years the kids had been indoctrinated um, in public school to think a certain way. And so it's going to be very important to have these conversations with our children. And 
a slight different angle that I wanted to go in on, on this same topic. It's also, as our sons and daughters are growing up, it's going to be really important to get them to look at the world around them with what I, we call the eye of discernment, to just really notice all the subtle messaging that's around, that may not be very obvious, that's trying to get them to accept this worldview. And one of the things that my sons have noticed is how effeminate the clothing is now for men in, in department stores. How s sometimes they can't even tell that the shirt is it for a man or for a woman, but it's being sold in the men's department. And so to really give our men strong role models on what it means to be a man and to give our young women strong role models on what it means to be a woman, and that it's okay to be feminine as a woman and it's okay to be masculine as a man because there seems to be this concerted effort right now to do away with masculinity and femininity corresponding with what our biological sex is. And so we need to make sure that, inshallah, we're helping our kids navigate that aspect of the environment right now as well. Jazakallah khair and mashallah, amazing viewpoints from both of you. Um, there's really not much to add, but just to piggyback off of something that Dr. Asad said as far as, um, you know, being um, able to kind of accept that you're not always going to, you know, reflect what everybody else is doing and being okay with that. You know, there's that famous quote um, attributed to Alexander Hamilton, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And this is really what we as Muslims have to commit to, that we have to instill in our children a strong sense of identity and who they are from a very early age, which is why, you know, falling into, you know, trends, and you see this, you know, throughout our community, a lot of parents aren't thinking about how that's going to affect and shape their sense of who they are. If you're always okay with them doing, oh, just because so-and-so is doing it, or just because classmates are doing it, or because it's popular, you have to, as a parent, know how to draw the line between allowing your kids to do things that are okay and healthy, and also just blindly saying, oh, if it's okay by everybody else's standards, I'll let you do that too. Because that's how they again, just start to, or they're conditioned to think that, you know, look at the majority messaging and that's what you should be doing. So that's why celebrity culture is so, you know, uh, strong and it has such an effect on youth because that's, you know, they, they look at those people as being, um, you know, role models and everybody else is so accepting of them. And, and so if we allow our kids to, to fall into that same trap, then, we shouldn't be surprised when they come home having adopted a lot of the views that um, everybody else has around them because who are their influencers? And this is where, again, being you know, really uh, smart as parents, we should know that by the time our teens enter, I mean, our children enter the world of adolescence, their peer group has far more influence over them than we do. Up until that point, we are their primary influencers. They'll listen, they obey. But you'll notice, every parent who has teens notices that by the time you know, adolescence kicks in, there's suddenly you know, more pushback. They don't, uh, you know, they don't uh, agree with everything. They start to argue a little bit and, and push back on certain things. So you have to be really um, on top of things in terms of who are their influencers. Who are they, you know, being influenced by? And that's why, going back to the conversations we've had so far, as far as devices are concerned, as far as friends are concerned, all of those things have to start very early. In my experience, I've found, and I'm sure the panelists will agree, that a lot of times there's not much oversight in those areas in the younger age and even up until middle school. And then high school kicks in and parents start to panic because it's like, oh no, what happened to my teen? I don't recognize them anymore. They're acting so different. Different. Um, and then you ask them questions like, okay, you know, who are their primary friends? I don't know. I don't know their friends. Uh, what, what are their interests? You know, what are, who, wh wh what are the things that they're into? I don't know. And this from um, the teen perspective also, it contributes to why there is this huge divide. I've talked to several teens who have told me that their parents have no idea who they are. 
They're like, they don't know who I am. They don't have any interest in the things that I like. They don't know my friends. And so we have to, again, as parents, look back and ask ourselves, how much time do we take if we're coming home and we are ourselves drawn to this and we're just, you know, busy with work stuff or family stuff and we don't take the time to actually have open conversations with our teens and then when a problem arises we suddenly panic and we call the masjid or we call Khalil Center or we go to you know Sister Hannah or, or Dr. Asad or whoever else that you see in the community as a leader and now you're trying to you know do damage control it's likely because you weren't paying attention to red flags that were there so we have to start paying attention you have to have conversations what are my children doing if they have a particular genre of music i've had now i think two or three cases where um, parents and teens have had huge fallout because of the music that the teens are into and uh, you know i had one mom very frankly tell me that she told her son that he, she he wasn't welcome because he was away for college um, in the house because of the way that he, the genre of music that he was into and you know she asked me what to do about it and I said what well, I mean I'm just gonna tell you my opinion that's a mistake um, I it's I and I, I would say in that situation instead of you know just closing them off shutting them out completely and having no interest whatsoever rather go back to uh, the basics of you know what I need to get to know you a little bit better why are you interested in this type of music or this new you know way of life that you lifestyle that you've adopted what is it that draws you to that let me enter your world a little bit and you know this is where just fostering an environment of mutual respect is so important if your parenting model is that's not good enough for me I don't like it you're turning your kids away and there's plenty of people who will receive them plenty of people who will receive them with open arms and tell them they don't ever have to go back to you because you're just closed-minded you're backwards and that's what's going to happen it's happening already so what's the solution is to say no i have to start being more open having discussions like I, we've been saying all day long and really being open to listening to their perspective uh with with respect you know with with that true sincere interest in your child because they're individuals as much as we want to hope that they are going to be uh, turn out a certain way that's not up to us right if 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 the prophets couldn't control how their children turned out we should realize we have no control outcomes are not in our hands they're with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what we can do is do our part to make sure that we always have that door open for them so that whatever they're into whatever interest they have whatever topics and you know I mean I have for example you know I had a, a teen say that they were very conflicted by this whole issue of LGBTQ because one of their friends from you know growing up it's a very close friend identified as gay and so it causes them constriction because how can I hate something but love someone who does that right um, and so again we have to be willing to hear those conversations but if our attitude is like haram no that's unacceptable you can never talk to that person again you're just f exacerbating the problem and your teen will absolutely find ways to uh, communicate with their friends because you're asking them to make a choice that's really difficult. But if we step back and say, you know what, as we've been saying, respecting an individual, a human being, because they are a human being and they, you know, even with all of their, the things that they do as an individual that we might not agree with, that shouldn't come, that shouldn't be a difficult thing for a believer, right? I mean, the Prophet said that was his example. He accepted people even if they were completely you know against him his own enemies he was able to show compassion and mercy to so I think we have to step back and say this sort of black and white thinking in general is causing a real serious problem between parents and teens and on this issue especially I mean I've seen it and not just in the surveys but in discussions I've had a lot of our teens are very troubled they feel like you know if parents aren't even willing to have a conversation about it and they're so close-minded then it just poses you know it, it starts to really emotionally affect them towards their parents but also the faith that their parents ascribe to we don't want to do that so you know just remembering 
being respectful, being open, being tolerant, but still being principled. This is the believer's stance, right? Alhamdulillah, yes, please. One point that, um, speaking about influence on our kids, that really resonated with me was something that Sheikh Alauddin Bakri shared a few years ago. He said that our children, at all times, they're being influenced in three different areas, at all times. It's either the school, or it's the streets, and by streets he meant their social environment, so who their friends are. The school, the streets, and the home. And he said that parents need to be winning in two out of three of those areas. So two out of three streets, school, home, two of those, the parents have to be the primary influence on their children. And a book that I would like to recommend that inshallah, because it's very easy for us to say, oh, you need to have open conversations, you have to get your kids to trust you. But the question is how, right? How do we get there? There's a wonderful book called Why Parents Need, Hold On To Your Kids, Why Parents Need To Matter More Than Peers. Hold on to your kids. Why parents need to matter more than peers. And it's written by two psychiatrists. One of them, his last name is Mate, spelled like M-A-T-E, like mate. And I believe the other last name is Neufeld, N-E-U-F-E-L-D. That book changed our parenting philosophy. And many people have told me that that book was a very um, big par created a big paradigm shift for them in how they raise their kids. So, and he starts out with talking about being with his teenagers. So, inshallah, there will be some very practical tips in that book and how to um, establish that trust with your children. And one of the things that we told our kids is that at all times, in every relationship, in every friendship, one person is influencing the other. So either you're influencing your friend or your friend is influencing you. It's never neutral. And so to help our children to really reflect on what role are they playing in their different relationships and what role are their friends playing on them and what direction are they taking them into. So to get them to reflect for themselves as well rather than us always talking at them. One little practical tip I wanted to share that I forgot to share earlier when um, the questions were coming in about how to have open communication with kids. One of my friends uh, told me about something that she does with her daughter that has worked really well for them. So I, I think it's worth sharing with others. She said that she keeps a diary um, by her bed and her daughter has access to that diary anytime she wants. And when her daughter has something that she wants to talk to her mother about but she doesn't feel comfortable actually discussing it face to face, she'll write it out in that diary to her mother, whatever issue she's facing. And the mom will read that diary entry from her daughter, and then she'll respond in that diary to her daughter. And so she said that that diary has gone back and forth between her and her daughter for a while, and they don't actually ever speak in person about whatever the topic is that might be um, bothering her daughter. Sometimes kids need a little bit of distance to actually be able to come close to their parents, to communicate with them, and anonymity can sometimes help. Some parents say that they have certain communications with their kids just over email because the kids aren't comfortable speaking face to face about certain issues. I know some of my most valuable conversations have happened in the car when my child is sitting next to me and we don't have to look at each other and we can just have these really deep conversations but it doesn't get uncomfortable where we're like in each other's faces, you know, having to look at each other's facial expressions. So just a, a little tip I wanted to share. So we've got a bunch of questions. Okay. <laughs> or, or actually, you guys can take it. Oh, okay. The forgiveness one. The forgiving one. Man, that's a tough one. Okay. All right, let's do some. So we're getting questions over text message as well that um, uh, Brother Munir is sending in. So we're going to try to address these. We have several questions over text and several uh, here. So do, is there one that you want to start off with? Anna? Uh, no, I think the one that... The forgiveness one? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good okay. 
There's a very tough question that I think we're trying to avoid, but mashallah, bismillah. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, I don't have an answer. Uh, there was a parent who filled out a survey online who asked a very good question. Um, and uh, to paraphrase, uh, the question was that my teen says that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so forgiving, then why can't I just do what I want to do and ask Allah for forgiveness afterwards? Um, and so this is a, a question that maybe some of us will be uh, posed, will have posed to us maybe in just different forms of, of uh, taking uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy as a, a license to, 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 to sort of stray. Um, my uh, thoughts on this, uh, and, and, and I want to very much say that I don't have an answer for this, but my thoughts on this would be uh, that I think it's important that you develop a, an understanding of sin that goes beyond points on the day of judgment, right? It's very important that they understand that disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a great accountant that we meet on the day of judgment who tabulates things and we go to hell or to heaven. A relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be developed in which there starts to become a type of love of his obedience and a shame with his disobedience. And the number one way to do that, and this is very difficult for all of us, is to model that. Right? Uh, this is not something that you can simply say to your child. You can use uh, conversations to further reinforce that. Um, but I would, I would help uh, the young adults to start to see the impact of sin upon the heart. Right? That if a bone heals, why shouldn't I just break your bone and it'll heal over time? Why not? Right? If you can lose weight, why can't I just, why don't we eat five cheesecakes in a row and gain 10 pounds, right? Over Eid, which sometimes happens. But then, and then it's okay because we can go to the gym, right? Because there's heart disease, there's consequences. And so it's important to help the child to see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this world of asbab, right? There's a famous uh, Moroccan saint who said, that the entire universe is meanings that Allah put into forms. Whoever realizes this will have learned many lessons. What does that mean? That Allah has placed many spiritual lessons in the physical world. It's a meaning. What happens to a plant if you pour Coca-Cola on it and you keep it in the dark? What happens to it? It's going to die. What happens when you give it water and sunlight and good soil? It's going to grow. Help the young adult start to see their spiritual heart as something that's real. This is not just haram, halal, day of judgment, adab. I can just make tawbah, right? They have to start to see that they, should, they will be ashamed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second thing is, of course, the ulama talk about a pre-planned tawbah not being a true tawbah. You cannot intend to sin and say, but I, then I will repent. The third aspect is obviously that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows how long our lives are and you don't ever want to feel safe from the makar of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has planned for you. You don't know. If we, Allah's forgiveness is there so that if we sin, we don't despair and that we can get out of it. It's not there to be abused. Okay? And so the ulama, they talk about the, that there are two wings that have to balance each other. Hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and fear of his justice and his punishment. If the young person, and this is something the ulama also talk about, that in youth, you have to emphasize fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he has punishment and if this happens, and you have punishment in the dunya before the akhirah for sins sometimes. You'll have difficulty, you'll have all of these things. But as somebody ages and they've accumulated sin in an elderly person, you remind them of the, the hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, that He's merciful, that He's forgiving. But because the youth always looks at Allah's mercy and says, I can get away with things. The elderly person is always thinking about everything that they've done and they can fall into despair. So you have to help them to balance out their hope with, with a healthy dose of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understanding that their hearts are far more than just uh, an accounting booklet of points for the Day of Judgment. I'm, and I'm not making light of sin and, and reward on the Day of Judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala erase all of our sins, inshaAllah. That's, that's easy for Him to do. But to also understand 
that this is the meaning of the Prophet ﷺ when his own wife asked him, our mother Sayyidatna Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked him, she said, Ya Rasulullah, why, why do you pray at night until your feet swell? His blessed feet would swell when Allah has given you paradise, He's promised you paradise and He's forgiven anything you could have ever done. And what was the Prophet ﷺ's response that we all know? Should I not then be a thankful servant? Should I not then be a grateful servant? It's not just about the points. He has a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's Habibullah. And he's teaching us to take our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beyond that. Wouldn't you be ashamed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see you? Right? As opposed to you'll get sin, you'll get this punishment. Wouldn't you be ashamed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? And I think these, these are the kinds of conversations that we should work to have um, so that our children understand that these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made forbidden, He's made forbidden for a reason. Out of his wisdom, his hikmah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Out of his wanting good for us as his ibad, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't see a, a, a harm except that he forbids it. And there isn't something good except that he's, he's encouraged us to do it. So they have to, if they see the sharia as arbitrary, the fun stuff is all haram and right, and the, all the difficult stuff is what we have to do. You have to help them to see it differently than that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us things that is for our heart and our soul to develop. So these are some thoughts of mine, but I definitely think this is a very difficult question. Um, and it's something again that doesn't have a, a, a solution, but has a treatment that you should uh, continue to have. And we have more questions. Yeah. No, bismillah. So one of the questions that's come in online, how can I generate love towards Salat and Quran in my kids? I see other older kids who are regulars at the masjid now rarely coming to the mosque unless forced by their parents. So there's a young man I know who, mashallah, every time I see him, he sits in the front row um, at Jummah. And every Jamaat prayer that I've ever seen him in, he's right there in the front row. And I was asking him about that, like, how, where does that desire come from or that habit? And he told me that when he was little, he's older now, he's uh, 19, when he was little, he said his father would give him a dollar every time he would go and sit in the front row. And he said, so as a child, he loved collecting those dollars, five dollars a day adds up. And he said, but now I just do it out of habit. It's, he knows he's not getting any dollars from anyone for sitting in the front row, but it's become his habit. And he, mashallah, broke it down really beautifully for me because we were talking about how is the best way to teach the religion and put a love for the religion and the practice of the faith in the next generation. And he told me that he thinks three things are very important. He said one is that there needs to be motivation. So he said when he was little, that dollar that he got for sitting in the front row was motivation. But now that he's older, the motivation is talking about akhirah, talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to really make sure that there's some motivation when you're talking to your kids about their ibadah. The second thing he said was role models. He, said, he named specific shiuch who were there in his community who inspired him and who he enjoyed watching while they were praying and that they were the ones who had a big influence on him on, on the way he prayed and his desire to pray. And the third thing he told me was, so he said, motivation, role models, and the third thing he said was understanding. He said it's very important to understand why you're praying and what you're saying and what the point is behind prayer. He said for many kids he's seen that parents say, oh Allah expects you to pray so you have to pray. It's haram not to pray. But they don't actually understand why and what's the purpose behind it. And as far as the question which says that they saw that kids who used to come regularly and you know maybe we're into the Quran or into praying but now they see that they don't come unless their parents are quote unquote forcing them to. What I've seen is that in life it's we're not just on the steady course there's ups and downs that come even in our own lives and if we look at ourselves and think that right now if I had somebody who was forcing me or telling me that I have to read this much Quran every day or I have to sit for this long in my prayer afterwards and do dua, would we rebel against that? Or would that be something that would make us go, yeah, that's something I want to take on? And 
it's important that when kids after the age of 14, what I've seen is that we need to kind of give them their space. Once you've established routines for them th throughout the early years, what I've noticed is after 14, you're really just maintaining whatever you've taught them up to the age of 14. With all three of my kids, I've seen that, that after 14, it's really hard to start implementing anything new. And whatever we've been teaching them up until that point is now what we're going to be maintaining. And I hope we can build on that. But if we are going to build on it, it's going to come from them. It's not going to come from us. It, it's going to be completely self-directed and self-motivated. And, you know, this, I learned it the hard way. One of my sons, um, when we gave him a car for his personal use, I told him that you can have the car, we're going to give you the car, but only on the condition that you go to the masjid for Fajr and Isha. So if you go to the masjid for Fajr and Isha, then, then you can have the car. And he had been going, but it had been hit or miss. It wasn't a regular thing. He'd been going on his own. But all of a sudden, I, I saw it take a dip. It wasn't, the, the effect was the opposite of what I had wanted and what I had hoped for. And he actually told me, he said, you know, Mama, up until now, when I was doing it, it was doing, I was doing it because it was a goal I was trying to achieve for myself. But now that you told me that in order to have the car, I have to go for Fajr and Isha to the masjid, it feels like a chore. And all of a sudden, the desire isn't there the way it was before. And I took it back. I, I apologized and I said he could have the car and as long as he's not going anywhere haram in it or doing anything haram in it, God forbid, he's welcome to, to use the family car. But, um, but that was a big lesson for me that you can't force kids to do, to do anything when they're older. And, and we're talking to parents of teens right now, so after the age of 14, you have to give them the space to figure it out and hopefully um, you've been setting routines and giving them role models throughout their life before. So there's questions about, uh, is it okay to give your teenager a phone? Um, every family has to assess their own child and their own relationship with their children and what they, w not every child is the same. And different children struggle with different kinds of addictions. Some children are able to set limits for themselves. Some aren't. They need you know, direction from their parents more than other kids. Um, personally, just for our families, just to share what we did, is our kids did not have smartphones um, throughout high school. And, um, but with the understanding that when they graduated from high school, they were going to get the latest iPhone. But they, so they had a light at the end of the tunnel. But throughout high school, they had um, dumb phones. And one of my sons said that other kids used to take pictures of his phone because they thought it was like such this, this antique relic. Nobody had seen dumb phones, you know. Um, and, you know, they, got, they said that people gave them a hard time and like, why don't you have a smartphone? But generally, if they told me they're having a lot of fun over there, mashallah. <laughs> I want to join that room. So... Uh, what did they tell me? They told me, oh yeah, they said that at the end of the day, even, even the kids who don't understand or who make fun of you or whatever, at the end of the day, they get that parents are authority figures. And if the kids say, you know what? My parents are the ones paying for my phone. I don't have a job. This is the phone I get. I got to make do with it. At the end of the day, everybody understands that. I mean, whether they think it's a good idea or not, you know, everyone has their own opinions. But Alhamdulillah, we, we, my 15-year-old has a smartphone at home that um, he's able to use to um, communicate on WhatsApp with family, um, but it stays at home. It doesn't leave the house, and uh, that's it. That they have flip, they had flip phones up until graduating from high school. That was our family. You probably have a different experience. Yeah. Which question? Should kids get cell phones? Yeah. Um, so I think this is one of those things that every family is different and every child is probably different. Um, and also the, the environment and the peer group, whether through relatives or friends or school, makes a big difference. So I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, and I typically think questions like this are more about principles and guidelines than they are about set rules that at this age it becomes suddenly appropriate. Um, certain people mature better, some people have better impulse control. 
other kids have very addictive personalities. So, um, yeah, I think we handled it a little bit differently. Um, this is a question uh, to touch upon. So the question says, it doesn't matter how much you create the good environment. Kids from age 12 to 14 are more likely to listen to their friends and try to isolate themselves from parents. And this is one of the age milestones. We cannot deny this milestone. So how, uh, so how, we parents, so how should we as parents deal with this and build more trust? This is a very good question. I think whoever asked this question, simply realizing that they're in a different milestone and who they will listen to um, is, is, is half the battle. Um, I'll share two brief points and then hopefully I just want to try to give time to get through the questions. Two brief points. Uh, one is I think it is important that yes, you show your child that you trust them, that you believe in them. Treating your child like a criminal will simply engender criminal behavior. They will start to hide things. They will, whatever you tell them they are, I even sometimes will bluff that I'm worried about something. I say, I'm not worried about you, mashallah. You have taqwa, you know, you know. And you tell them these things, and it will become their own inner voice of, of what my parents believe me to be. But if you say, no, 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 I'm not letting you out alone. I know you. If you have freedom, I know what you're going to do with it. Then, uh, oh, well, yeah, maybe I should. If that's what they think of me, I might as well enjoy it And if I'm already getting blamed for it. So I think it's very important to have that positive reinforcement. I just want to, I don't like to translate ayahs, but I wanted to read this verse from uh, Surah Ali Imran. And it just, we'll just translate it, with no commentary, and just think about how it may relate to this. Now this, according to the Mufassirin, was revealed uh, in the context of the Battle of Uhud. When some of the Sahaba had left their post, and the Prophet Wasallam suffered some injuries, etc. A, a, a very sad day for the Prophet Wasallam and the Sahaba. So Allah Subh'anaHu Wa says, بَعْدِ عُذْبِنَا مِشْتَانَ رَجِيمٍ فَبِرَحْمَةً مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ And it was by God's grace that you were gentle with them. Okay, that it's Allah's grace that He gave you the gentleness when you dealt with them. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَدِيدَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكِ And had you been harsh and hard of heart, they would have indeed broken away from you. If you treated them in a way, he's now talking about the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba, that had you been harsh and hard-hearted with them, they would have uh, broken away from, them, from you. فَاعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَوَكِّلِينَ So pardon them then and pray for them that they are forgiven and take counsel with them in all matters of public concern. Then when you have decided on a course of action, place your trust in Allah. The role of tawakkul in parenting cannot be overstated. You have to have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you think your parenting can do it, you're, you're really deluding. I don't think anybody, I don't think any parent of a teenager feels that way, alhamdulillah, right? You know that you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace. You know that you need His, his help. So he says, so place your trust in God, for verily God loves, loves those who place their trust in Him. So I think that is a, a, a nice uh, parenting related verse to think about, that it's from فَبِرَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ That it's through the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you were gentle with them. So I would say, tell them, be gentle with them, uh, forgive them, seek, make istighfar for them, seek their counsel, start to treat them like an adult, start to bring them in out of childhood. And you know, the, 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 I, one of the things I, I always say to my teenager is, you know, what distinguishes a child from an adult is a child is only thinking about their needs. And they want, it's not strange when a child sees candy and says, I want candy, right? That's what they are. But when you transition to an adult, you start to, you have to start just thinking about the group and about others and my behavior. My nafs is no longer guiding every decision I make. And so your adultness is measured by that and not by your height, not by your weight, and not by your, how many days you've been alive. That's what defines men, because he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a young man, and that's what defines women. One of the questions here says, many of the answers provided are about communication with our teenagers. What can I do in a situation where the teenager does not want to talk? 
He just wants to be left alone. That's very, very normal. I think every parent here of a teenager, especially uh, those of us who have sons, know that experience of, of uh, young men, especially wanting to pull away, wanting privacy, um, not wanting to be nagged, not wanting to be asked 100 questions about what are you thinking, what's going on. So it's, going, it's more important to create a positive environment and make sure that they feel safe and that they feel comfortable and that they actually want to just hang around with you in comfortable silence. And sometimes something may come out after a long time of just sitting around quietly, but not feeling like they have to produce or they have to present something to you when, when you guys are sitting together. It's important that, again, like that triangle we talked about of friendship, the positivity being the base, it should be a positive experience. And that sometimes can mean just sitting in comfortable silence. You, you can't force anyone to talk. You have to make sure that they feel safe. And the way they feel safe is by knowing that you're, you know, having a high opinion of them, the way Dr. S had mentioned, um, not constantly grilling them, trying to get stuff out of them, not checking up on them, and um, letting them know that you accept them the way they are and that you're here if they ever do want to talk. It won't last forever. At some point, kids do share. It may not be today or tomorrow, but it, it does happen. Yeah. Well, one tiny point on this matter of youth not wanting to, to talk. Uh, Two quick points, just because we're tight on time. One is, for if you still have children who are younger than teens, you have to start investing in that relationship early. If the child is somebody t to not be seen or be heard, and then when they're 14, they say, no, 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 hold on, talk to me about everything on your mind, that's not a fair expectation, right? So you have to invest in that relationship. And the second thing is, uh, if the relationship is always either lecturing or telling them how they should be living, that's not an enjoyable conversation that a teen would like to sustain. As much, as difficult as it may be for us, develop an interest in what they're interested in, no matter how silly you think it is, right? Develop a, listen to them. It's amazing sometimes my, I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but sometimes my son tells me, he goes, Baba, I know you don't care, just pretend to care for the next five minutes. Tell me, yeah, oh, subhanAllah, wow, right? And he knows I don't care, right? But he just wants an audience. But even in that listening to him, right? Even in that listening to him, I, will, I want him to speak to me about something I think is the dumbest thing in the world, right? Because I, I want him to feel that kind of connection, that positivity, uh, to have somebody listen to you and smile and say, really, oh my God, no, no, he's a horrible player. This player is better. You think he's, a, you know, I stopped watching basketball for years. I couldn't tell you a single player. I was still in the Michael Jordan era. Now because I have a teenager, you have to start to know, you, you have to. Otherwise, what's your conversation going to do? How was school today? Do you have any homework? Did you clean your room? Who wants to talk to me at that point? So that's something else I think I would I'd keep in mind. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and if your kids are playing video games, play video games with them. So you know what they're playing and they, they have a fun experience with you. <laughs> All right. Uh, How are we doing? We got the reinforcements. Oh, I think, I think we're wrapping up. It's 9.16, right? Uh, any other questions? There were a couple of questions that some different people had sent up about how to help a child, um, how to keep a teenager from falling in love. And <laughs> hearts are hearts. I don't know if we can control who, who a person likes and doesn't like and how strongly they, they feel um, for, for somebody of the opposite gender. I think, again, going back to making sure that we try and create a safe environment where our kids, we can talk to our kids about, about their feelings. What, what I, I've seen um, some parents do that I think is, um, is a good way to get your kids to think more future facing is to talk about what kinds of qualities they'd like to see in a future spouse so that they're not actually talking about the person they may have a crush on right now or that they may be in love with right now. Talk about like, what, what are you looking for like when you get married one day, inshallah, what are the qualities that you'd like to see in a future, in a future spouse? And then hopefully through that lens, they'll share you know, what, what qualities they like, don't like, and, 
helping, teaching them how to do dua for what they want and doing dua for them in their presence. Like may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you a spouse who's going to take you to Jannah one day and who you're going to take to Jannah one day, inshallah. You guys are going to be positive influences on each other and who's going to bring our families together and letting them see that what's important to you as well. And, um, but as far as like protecting your kids from falling in love, I don't think anyone's ever been able to do that. The heart is the heart. So, but we can create halal environments, definitely, you know, like teaching our kids about how they should be interacting with the opposite gender and um, whatnot. Okay, anything else? I think that's it. I, we need Hasai to come <laughs> wrap things up for us. Oh, sure. So, so going into a room of uh, boys, it was pretty quiet for a while. You guys are talking about that. And uh, I thought, you know, man, this half hour is going to be difficult. We're going to be back in here within a half an hour. But the kids started to really open up. And I met a lot of, I think, about 20 wonderful young teenage boys. And uh, I'll just quickly summarize the theme. Uh, the, the, the communication gap is the number one theme that came up and the generation gap and the cult, uh, the communication gap, the generation gap and the continental gap. So by that I mean communicating, uh, under, the adults understanding what the kids are going through, that would be the second one, and um, just the adults not understanding the environment that the kids are growing up in and they're trying to be good and they're trying to do it their own way, they have their own hearts and sort of us as adults kind of, um, you know, living life the way our parents raised us. So those were kind of the three themes that came up. Uh, they were all good-natured, good-hearted. Uh, one of the things that, you know, really, really made me sad that I heard was, um, I'm not going to try anymore because I'll be leaving the house soon enough. That's the most sad thing to me that, that I hear is when kids shut down and they're not being heard and they know they just have two or three more years and they'll be gone, they won't have to deal with it. And that's when the parents are going to be sad. So my response to the, to, the, to, the, to the boys were, you know, as a parent, I have to worry about whether when they leave the house, they're going to want to call dad back and talk to him just to see how he is. And if I'm not concerned with how I feel, that I'm not going to do the right thing for them. So I would say to the parents, if you want your children to come back and call you, you have to invest in what they want and what they think and understand how they feel and make them happy. And it's okay if they mess up because they're not perfect, but you have to be the adult for them and keep that relationship for them. They are toddler adults. So a 15-year-old is a three-year-old toddler in the body of an adult. They're toddler adults. So uh, really good kids, mashallah, they opened up. Um, I don't know we, if you heard the cheering contest. The girls cheered and we cheered. I, I think the guys won. Um, but yeah, so, so the really, really good kids. And that's what makes me, uh, I would say that the adult starts here and the child starts here and the child grows. And the adult stays the same and then there's a crisscross point. So the kid is going this way and the adult's still staying the same, it doesn't work. So as adults, the kids come here and then we have to go with them. You have to change your adult. You have to change your parenting style by the age of 11 to 13. Seriously with boys. Um, I don't have that experience with girls. See how do ones here. But um, be, be really, really trying to be flexible and what Dr. Asad and, and Hannah said here, and I heard the last part of it, is just really having the adults invest in making the strategy of change. You guys are the adults. You have to find a strategy for change that works for both you and your children as they grow. 
So inshallah, that's, that's the advice that I would have and that's my experience in the room. I'll turn it over for uh, Sidi Harun's wise words. Uh, we're wrapping up, so I just, uh, I guess to, re to reinforce uh, what Brother Zisan said, something that I took note of was how my parents react prevents me from opening up. How my parents react prevents me from opening up. Some of them have parents that they said they just can't talk to about what they're actually going through. Um, some of them said they have parents who told them to come and tell us anything, talk to us about anything, but when they did that, the reaction was so negative or left them feeling so negative when they went to their rooms, they said, I never want to do that again. Mm. So now I'm just going to put my head down and just bear with it until, like the other brother said, I'm off to college soon, so I'm out of there. So another one was that a theme that they felt was God forgives, but my parents don't. Mm. God forgives, but my parents don't. Toba or repentance is one of the primary gifts of religion. Besides like knowledge of God himself, the gift of religion is repentance, a, a, a mechanism by which we can right our wrongs. And so we're actually taught that we should be forgiving to the degree we want Allah to forgive us. That's a principle to, to memorize and live by. Forgive others to the degree you wish Allah will forgive you. Also, a big one was the inability to compromise. Learn to negotiate certain things with your children, especially when it comes to things that are not explicitly forbidden by the religion. Learn to negotiate. A big theme was driving wanting to drive. And honestly, it's something I'm personally terrified of. I, I helped my wife and I, we partnered in helping one of our daughters drive. And after that, I told her, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> so now from our youngest daughter, who is now, you know, eager, she saw her big sister be able to drive now. She's been so eager and hyped to drive. I told my wife, honestly, that's you. It's not me. And that was fair. We negotiated. I was up front with my daughter. Do not take it personally. It's just that I did not enjoy the, enjoy the experience of teaching your older sister how to drive. It was too terrifying. It caused me too much anxiety. It was affecting our relationship negatively. And so I just can't do it. Alhamdulillah. But we negotiate, especially for things that are not for, forbidden in the religion. Your children want to do certain things learn to have that discussion. Well, hey, maybe if I let them do this, that will actually empower them positively in the, in the area that I would like to see them have growth in. One person was like, I want to be able to drive. I love cars. I'm very passionate about cars. But they said I got to get a 3.5 and then a 4.0. And I don't mean the engine, OK? So it's like, you know, as a parent, well, you know, maybe if I give them some flexibility, it will actually instill a sense of confidence that my parents trust and love me, and that will spill over into improvements in other areas. Also, stop comparing to other quote-unquote perfect family members <laughs> was a big one. They referenced, you know, a certain cousin or older was a Hufaz, so it was like, they're always being compared. Your child is your child. Meet them where they are and have an attitude. Like I say in my household, our way is to build up, not tear down. Do not tear your kids down. You are the means by which they came into the world. They're one of your most precious assets. If you have a kid, that means you signed up for that. So take that as your prized possession and let them feel like you are, they are the star of your life. Like I'm always telling my daughters, I'm your biggest fan. I'm your biggest fan. You should be the biggest fan of your children. 
and not be afraid to sit down and level with them, meet them where they are, and not act like it's just all about you. It's not all about you. When you got married, it ceased being all about you. Marriage is a compromise situation. You have to, right, compromise and negotiate with your husband. You have to compromise and negotiate with your wife, right? Same thing with your children. It's not just this constant top down because what that's doing is making them check out and that's the last thing you want them to do. You want yourselves to be the first check-in. So I challenged the, the, the boys. I said, I'm just challenging you to have that just so you know moment with your parents. Just say, just so you know mom or dad, when you talk to me this way, when I do come to you, you make me feel so negative, I never want to talk to you again. Does any parent like to hear that from their child? No. No. So I challenge them to have that conversation, and I also bring it and put it back in you all's court. Have that conversation. Have that just so you know conversation with your kids. Hey, just so you know, I actually love you and care about you. I just have a hard time understanding your culture. The way, the environment that you're growing up in, I can't relate with that. I can't relate with the type of music you listen to, the type of artists you listen to. If you say the word rap, I just add a C in front of it, automatically, okay? So be willing to have that conversation. I'm challenging you to have that, let's just be real with each other conversation, to be willing to admit as a parent, you know, I'm just treating you the way my parents treated me, for better or for worse. And maybe that's not working. I'm just disciplining you the way my parents disciplined me, and maybe that's not working. Have that conversation, because at some point, the relationship has to be genuine and real. It has to be genuine and real. If not, it's just you're raising, they're looking at you as a hypocrite, and it breeds hypocrisy in themselves too. And that's what I wanted to say. May Allah make it easy. Ameen. Again, sage advice. We are right about at the end of this. I wanted to end with actually reading something and I ask you for just patience. I'll try to go through this as fast as I can. But it was a post that was um, posted on Sunday and it was actually Sidi Harun who recommended that we read this to really just drive point, uh, drive the points that we've been uh, making even further for all of you uh, about open communication, negotiation, all of the stuff that was just mentioned. So I'm just going to go ahead and read. Bismillah. This is from a sister named Susie Ismail. She also works with teens, so please pay attention. Last weekend, I spoke at a youth conference on the topic of gender interaction. When the talk finished, I asked the room of over 100 teens aged 13 to 18 years old if they had any questions. I was met with complete silence. Thinking that hesitation and embarrassment may be the culprit, I shared my cell number with the teens and asked them to text me any questions they had on the topics we covered. Expecting maybe four to five questions from a few brave souls, I was shocked to see my phone light up with question after question after question that continued late into the night, long after the session was over. In the end, I received over 100 text messages from 79 different teens. Some of the numbers were cloaked in anonymity and couched in doubt of whether or not parents might find out. The questions ranged from, is marijuana and vaping really haram? To why do my parents hate me so much? To how do I stop people from bullying me and beating me up in school? To comments such as, I'm not sure I believe in God anymore. Or I am really depressed and sometimes I don't think life is worth living. To heartbreaking words of how do I recover from something really bad that I've never told anyone about. Buried amidst the questions about sexuality, LGBTQIA, uh, plus secret boyfriends and body image, there lives a palpable undercurrent of fear, sadness, loneliness, and a type of desperate reaching out. What broke my heart was after staying up late and responding to each and every text, so many of those teens sent back a surprised message of, I didn't think you would really answer, or wow, I didn't expect a response. 
Have we turned our backs on our youth that they no longer ask because they expect to be dismissed or ignored? Have we led them to believe that they will not be heard, validated, or responded to? So many of these questions and comments that came through my phone that night were stitched with threads of helpless desperation, a cry that shook the depths of my consciousness as a mother, a speaker, an educator, a counselor, and a community member. We are so quick to blame our youth for not talking to us, but are we accessible enough to them in the way that they need to speak and express themselves? Do we simply expect them to mold to our method of communication and the guidelines we provide? Last weekend, I learned more from the teens that attended that session and from the texts that came in than they could ever learn from me. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us all as parents, teachers, mentors, friends, and community leaders to be better, to do better, to open up the channels of communication with our children, to listen, to hear, and to love. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our failings in raising our children with a sense of security and safety, safety to face their fears with us by their side. May God make us better than we were and better than we are in protecting our youth and being there for them when they need us the most and when we need them the most to learn, to understand, to grow and to heal together before it is too late. We cannot lose another heart, another mind, or another soul. Ameen wa ajma'een. Everybody say ameen MashaAllah. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for staying, for attending, for entrusting us with your beautiful children. We had some amazing conversations. I just spent uh, a short amount of time with them, but even that time, I wish I could uh, increase it. And I asked them, alhamdulillah, it was unanimous. Would you come again if we provided this forum for you? All the hands went up. Please allow the people in this community, like the panelists up here with me and myself and Suzanne, Ustada Suzanne, who's in the room still with the girls, to do this service with you, alongside you. It takes a village. We have to support one another. We are here for you. And I expect, wallahi, when my kids are hit teens, I'm going to be coming to all of you as well. Like, be there for me. I need to look to my community and say that there will be people there who will help them navigate tough conversations. And so I really want us to embrace these events if we do this again inshallah I pray we're able to do this again that you come back you take the surveys uh, online please and, and ask your children to do that as well do the questionnaires uh, inshallah with that uh, we'll close the um, event but before I do we're, we'll have a light dinner afterwards so please make sure to eat I'm going to ask Dr. Assad to please close us out with a with a short dog it's the doctor you the doctor the heart doctor Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad tib al-qulubi wa dawaiha wa afiyat al-abdani wa shifaiha wa nur al-absari wa diyaiha wa quut al-arwahi wa ghithaiha wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasliman kathira. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق وأنا هادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقدره العظيم Oh Allah, we ask you to give us and our children all of the akhlaq al-Muhammadiyya and give us the character of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم We ask you to make our homes homes of love of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم love of Allah سبحانه وتعالى Make our homes filled with deen and filled with faith We ask you to enable us to raise our children in a way that is pleasing to you and is good for them in both this world and the next. We ask you to guide them and to protect them from themselves and from society. We ask you to make their mistakes small ones and make their mistakes things they learn from. And we ask mm -hmm. you to help us to guide them and give them good friends and good spouses. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this community one in which all of its youth are protected and mm -hmm. rescued and saved and die on full and complete faith. Mm -hmm. In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his blessed messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take any of the difficulties that are present in any of the homes out May he make all of it easy May he make love between parent and child Between husband and wife and between siblings May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make sakina in our homes Make it places of love of one another and love of Allah and his messenger Wa sallallahu wa barak ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Taslima kathira bi surat al-fatiha